<laughs> Thanks. All right. So we're broadcast to all attendees. I don't um, know how we see them as far as. Uh, okay, now. So people are starting to pour in. We got four so far. They're going to start rolling in. I'd give it like another five minutes because they're. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for getting so many people. So, uh, Todd, just so you know, we, most of it's, it's really, we have a, we sent this out to our whole spirits team, um, but also our whole sales force in Georgia and in New York and maybe New Jersey. Oh, wonderful. So, um, yeah, you've got at least two full people. I had heard that. Oh. So we had Jessica, Jessica Partington just joined us. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. hello. And Peter Vestinos is joining us. Wonderful. Hello. So, Todd, I'm so happy I get to see you virtually because when I was at your distillery, I missed you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you, you get to see that I'm in terrible need of a haircut. Yeah, Sarah, I'm on doing the, I, I need that too. And I'm turning, you know, a brunette instead of blonde. So, uh, yes, I, I'm roots. doing the gray Good thing here for you. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm so glad that we get to do this. But I fell in love with your distillery. I almost cried. Oh. You can ask Martin; he was there. I was like, "This is beautiful." Well, thank you. It was that, a great tour, and everyone did a great job. That—that's all my family's work. I can't take any credit at all for the design. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, did, they did it beautiful. We're trying to make it feel like a a family shop and and not feel like a factory like you know so many of them that i've run into and and i think we accomplished that it feels homey and it feels like a campus and that's uh that's intentional so yeah. it looks like we got 21 people wow boy you guys must really be out of things to do if you're getting <laughs> <laughs> into me i have a captive audience legally you guys no <laughs> choice <laughs> This has been me, by the way, calling all the governors and forcing everybody to stay home so I can keep doing these little webinar thingies. <laughs> That's how politically powerful I am, let me tell you. Nice. Let a few more trickle in. Yeah, I'll just let a couple more trickle in and then we'll, uh, we'll kick it off here. Okay. Peter, I can't tell. Is that a real background or a fake one? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was a mute. Uh, no, this is um, this is Sparrow in Chicago. It's right on. Bar, bar I'm uh, partnering. Oh, you are really there. All right. Yeah, I keep laughing as people get more and more stir crazy on these things. It's like Star Wars backgrounds and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And we'll have to, everybody has to take a shot the first time a five-year-old wanders into the screen because you know that's coming. <laughs> um, that, that, that's happened to me when I was at, uh, at home for the last one, so. Uh, if I don't have a five-year-old, how else can I get a shot? There's videos, there's videos out there. I'll have to think on that. You know what, you're free to drink whenever you like. I'm not gonna stand in your way. I did hear there was one that if a dog pops up during a virtual video that you take a shot on that one too. Yeah, so. see, this is a good way to get nice and stewed and make these a lot more entertaining, that's for sure. But yes, <laughs> I, I've done more than a few where the kid just sat on their lap and listened to us babble about nothing for, for 30 minutes. So whatever works. The nice thing is, is that everybody understands that this is the boat we're on and um, you know, the kids don't remember any of this stuff. They remember the good stuff out of this. So I try and I think everybody's trying to focus on that as much as we possibly can. And, and uh, my five-year-old is obviously just loving all of the, I, I, I come in around 11 o'clock every day and she's, you know, we're very lucky to be able to do this, but, but for, for us, it's, she's enjoying the parent time that she doesn't normally get. And so I'm in at 11 every day for, this is five weeks straight now of making hand sanitizer. So we're, we're hoping to change that in, in the next couple of weeks. We've been using New Belgium beer. If it's okay, I'm just rambling for now. I'm waiting yeah, yeah. for people to come on, okay. Um, so we've been uh, using New Belgium beer. They've donated over 50,000 gallons and counting wow. uh, of beer to turn it into 95% spirit. And now, um, like so many of my colleagues, I'm an 
uh, unwilling expert in hand sanitizer production. Um, we're proud to help. We, we've, we're, we're producing about a thousand gallons a week uh, of hand sanitizer, which if you don't know is a ton, but we have this stuff that they'd use the Air National Guard here in Colorado to fly it to rural hospitals because they're short. Wow. They're getting caught up happily. Um, but at the start, we had every hospital, you know, city of Thornton City, all the city managers, everybody desperate trying to get a hold of, of hand sanitizer. And so, um, sorry, I have to shut this stupid thing off. <laughs> um, uh, but it's starting to calm down a little bit. I mean, I know every, every state is a little bit uh, different, but we're, we're slowly getting uh, caught up, but it's, uh, it's gone absolutely everywhere in, in the state of Colorado. And it's finally we had enough to send us some liquor stores, you know, basically anybody that's dealing with the public that doesn't have quick access to sink, um, you know, grocery stores, liquor stores, uh, any of that kind of thing. And uh, all of us distillers are just kind of a little bit, we finally get the New York Times to write a, about us, and it's not about our delicious spirits. It's about me. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, can't you tell everybody how delightful we are in another? But anyway, we're, 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 we're proud to be able to help, but, but we, I, I think I can speak for all of us that we'd rather just be out doing our normal jobs. So. For sure. Would you like to It'll get It'll be going? one for the history books that you always remember. The, the, there are more than a few history people. book, you know. You got it. Well, we already have. We already put a bottle of hand sanitizer in our little kind of walk through memory lane, so it's already in there. But there's more than a few collectors out there, the bourbon whiskey nerds that are trying to collect. It's like Jesus. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of funny, but at the same time, I'm like, man, you have taken your hobby to a different level anyways uh, should we get going so i don't yeah let's go ahead and get going do a brief intro and then i'll let you uh kind of take it away so um thank you everybody for joining it looks like we have uh our nine panelists and 34 attendees right now so thanks everybody for joining um for those of you up north i'm tristan anderson i'm the spirit specialist here in georgia um and we are privileged to have uh, todd leopold with us today um and we are going to uh dig in with him um so um, my first uh, encounter with the uh, Leopold brothers was in 2009 at Holman and Finch. Um, I was a bartender and staging over there and getting to uh, know the uh, good folks that ran um, Atlanta's first uh, cocktail forward bar. Uh, Greg Bests and uh, Andy, Andy Minchow um, introduced me to uh, uh, Leopold brothers and they pretty much had the whole lineup there. I'd never heard of it. Um, and it's love. <laughs> and um, yeah, just brought into the programs that I started running at right after that. Um, and I think one of the most fun stories um, for, for me to hear about Leopold Brothers in Georgia, um, we were, I believe, and Todd can correct me, we, I think we were the first state east of, Mississippi, east of the Mississippi to bring on uh, Leopold Brothers. And um, that was due to Bill Yorks, who is now our director of purchasing, I believe, for the Southeast. And um, Funny enough, I think Bill and uh, Todd and Scott grew up, oh, well, they lived in the same neighborhood. And this was, this was a long time ago before, uh, this was, I don't know, you guys were kids, I believe. Yeah. So, so Bill started, uh, he was Quality Wine and Spirits, um, and he started um, the Spirits Division of Quality Wine and Spirits in the early 2000s. And as Scott and Todd got fired um, up into their, uh, their distilling, um, basically Bill heard about them and was like, whoa, is that Scott and Todd that I used to live in the neighborhood with, those, the kids? And uh, now they are running a distillery and he was running a distributor. And uh, you know, Georgia became the first state to uh, bring it across the Mississippi. Um, but um, so not to let me ramble too much longer, but wanted to introduce Leopold Brothers and Todd. Um, Leopold Brothers was founded in 1999 as a sustainable micro a microbrewery in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, within a couple of years of starting the brewery, they turned to spirits. Um, Scott and Todd relocated their operation to Colorado several years later, focusing exclusively on spirits. Um, since that time, they've cultivated a reputation for pushing pre-prohibition methods, sustainable practices, and introducing some of the first American-made spirits in categories ranging from maraschino to Navy gin to uh, Peritivo and Amaro. 
Um, Todd is a three-time consecutive James Beard Award semifinalist for Outstanding Beer, Wine, and Spirits Professional. Um, they've recently completed construction on expansion of a traditional malt floor, making them one of the largest malting floor, uh, floors operating in a distillery in the world. Um, and most recently, as Todd just mentioned, as demand grew during the COVID crisis, Leopold Brothers partnered with several local companies um, in labeling trucking, brewing, creating hundreds, of, um, thousands of gallons of sanit uh, hand sanitizer and donate them free of charge to healthcare facilities, public works, homeless shelters, retailers, all sorts of companies on the front line. Um, so, so many accolades, so many amazing things that we can uh, talk about and say about uh, the Leopold Brothers. And from there, I'm going to stop rambling and uh, let's, uh, let's chat with Todd. And, I, and I'm going to start rambling, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I guess they moved up the James Beard uh, announcement, I think is going to be sometime next week. So, so I told my wife we get to see if, uh, if we're uh, not moving on for the third year in a row. And we'll just keep at it. The, the first year that we were nominated, it's, for those who don't know, it's uh, – uh, all brewers, all distillers, um, and all winemakers in one single category nationally. So just getting this far is, is we're certainly honored uh, to make it that far. But the first year that, that uh, we made it, it was won by a 95-year-old winemaker. So I told my wife we might have to wait a while <laughs> before we get, uh, get one of those things. But anyways, um, so... Uh, I'm Todd Leopold. Uh, it's, uh, the business is with my older brother, Scott Leopold. Uh, he got his master's from Stanford in environmental engineering. Uh, so he does a lot of work on the pollution prevention side of things and the sustainability side of things before it was even a word. Um, that's kind of why we got into this. We wanted to show people um, how to make an environmentally sustainable factory um, is, is what got us, uh, got us into the business. So just real quick tidbit on that, a typical uh, brewery, distillery, winery for every bottle of spirits produced or beer or wine, you get anywhere between four bottles of wastewater and 35 bottles of wastewater, depending on how you manage things. Um, a really, you know, world-class uh, brewery that really works on it these days will be around 4.1, 4.2 bottles of wastewater, and we're at two and change. Um, if you ever have a chance to, to come and visit us, you can see our wooden fermenters and the processes that we put in that eliminates water usage or, or, uh, in places where, you know, we can get away with it that you can't at, at, uh, uh, at a brewery or a winery where, you know, you have to make sure everything's absolutely sanitary, which means, of course, lots of cleaning and lots of disinfecting. And, of course, everybody's aware of that these days, right? But anyways, uh, my, my background... Uh, as in Bring first, I went to a Bring school in Chicago called the Siebel Institute, graduated from there in 95, went to a Bring school in Germany, um, did my apprentice work over there, focusing on lager production. And as I explained, uh, this Tristan was kind enough to explain, we opened up a brew pub. That's how we got started in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, in 1999, making unfiltered lagers wasn't exactly the smartest business plan in the world, and that's my fault. But um, we had a big place and when you only serve beer, the licensing, I don't have to explain that to people in Georgia, the licensing in Michigan is a car crash, right? So you're only allowed to sell what it is that you made. And when you only sell beer in 1999, that's a, that's a really bad business plan. And the only way to get out of it was to get into distilling. So I went to distilling school in Kentucky, went back overseas to work in distilleries in Austria and Germany, making eau de vies. And then I came back and we were really one of, if not the first distillery pub in the country. So I made five, six different kinds of, of uh, wildly unpopular German uh, unfiltered lagers. Um, and then the vodka, the gin, the triple sack. So it's a roundabout way of saying um, why we make so many different things. This is very unusual, especially at the time when we started in 01. If you think about what the landscape was, um, everybody just makes one thing, right? They just make whiskey or you just make gin. So we were really the, one of the very first distilleries to make a really wide line of spirits um, out there and it was a necessity as a mother of invention. So that's why we did that. And that's why we have so many. And of course we realized rather quickly, especially trying to sell things in 2001, um, that, that, you know, trying to sell gin or trying to sell the, these more difficult spirits or vodka where, as we all know, the payola is a little bit more aggressive. We can kind of sneak under the radar with our, with our liqueurs and our other, other spirits. So we found that was a nice way to, 
to kind of sneak our way under the back bar. But in any event, um, uh, the building that we're at now, and Tristan, anytime you want to roll through slides to help uh, uh, paint that picture, we're on a four acre uh, campus in Denver now. Um, I'm in the tasting room. Um, you can kind of see, as you can tell, there's um, just like everywhere else, no humans here, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, our, our, our campus, um, we're, we're able to, we have eight stills now. We're showing the three chambers still now up on the screen. Um, and we're just, I'm just going to jump around, Tristan, if that's okay, and just kind of follow what we're doing. So the three chambers still, this is something that we put in uh, uh, about four, four years ago, something like that. This was a still um, that was a still of choice around the 1800s to make rye whiskey. It was an anomaly. Um, there, there's quite a few kind of landmark papers that the IRS of all people commissioned where they looked at, you know, 33 different distilleries in one paper. Um, about half of them made rye, half made bourbon. All but one of the distilleries that made rye used a chamber still. And without boring you with details, this chamber still is designed to extract maximum flavor out of the, the raw materials, the rye. And you extract as a maximum amount of oils, which really completely changes the mouthfeel. It makes the finish almost sweet. It's the same reason that vodka producers like to add glycerin or sugar. This elevated oil content makes the, the, uh, the finish on it last for years. Um, but it also is a very enormous whiskey. It's extracting maximum flavor out of that rye mash um, as possible. And as you know, in the, in the you know, 40 after Prohibition and after World War II, um, in America, flavors was out, blandness came up, right? Right spirits started to take off. And this type of, of, uh, of uh, rye whiskey just almost completely disappeared. The last still, as far as we know, some, from talking with David Wondrich a few times about this, the, the historian, um, the last one shut down in Baltimore, as far as we can tell, in 1966. Um, so we revived this still about five years ago. It's the only one that's uh, in operation um, in the world, unless you want to count. Uh, there, there's one chamber still that was revived by Maison Ferrand, um, but they're making rum and they really haven't released anything out of it yet. But um, th th this will be something we're going to release next year. It's an 80% rye, 20% floor malt in it. It's an unbelievably large whiskey and it's the only one in the world. And the good news for everybody here is you can get as much of it as you want. Um, we have been putting down large quantities um, um, for quite a, quite a while now. And our intent is to release it as a five-year-old bottled in bond. The first issues will be five-year-old bottled in bond um, starting next fall. So that's the three chambers still. In addition to that, um, if you look at Tristan's background, um, <laughs> with whatever it is you want to call that, those are the other stills that we have behind his head, if you want to have a look at him and his pretty face. Uh, You'll, you'll see uh, two other smaller stills that are on his left. Those are uh, the stills that are used to make um, gins or eau de vies or anything where I'm looking for a refined aroma. The stills that are to the right, um, those are the pot stills that we use for our whiskey and our bourbon, which is what we'll talk about next. So the American small batch whiskey and the Maryland rye that are currently available out there, those are pot distilled. Um, a few things that are a little bit different about us. Um, one, again, as I mentioned, my German background, uh, there's an old uh, Bavarian brewing adage for young brewers that you know, you, uh, your customers should not be able to tell how strong your beer is until they try and get it from the table, which always gets a bit of a chuckle. But what that means is, is that they want you to use cooler temperatures. So the, the American, I don't know, how do I say this, the modern tradition, the modern pathway um, is to ferment in the 80s and 90s. You're fermenting very hot with the intention when you stress yeast out, you create a lot of esters. So they're intentionally trying to make a fruity whiskey by stressing the yeast out by using high temperatures. Um, what we prefer to do is ferment in the 60s, so much cooler. And what that does is it, it's, it's much more gentle on the yeast. The yeast can lazily ferment and consume the substrate of that mash and not give out um, uh, the, those esters. And the biggest ester of all is ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate is literally nail polish remover. Um, but, but for all of you uh, spirits uh, purveyors, that, uh, that is the main thing that people describe as hot or heat, right, in, in a distillate. So when you ferment in the 90s and you turn it into a whiskey, you're going to have a lot of heat in that spirit. That's okay for most of the premium whiskeys. Uh, for the, you know, in the scotch industry, they're putting it down for 10, 15 years. 
and bourbon, they're putting it down in those charred barrels for you know, somewhere between four and, and 12 years. At that point, you've extracted so much uh, uh, wood sugars and other compounds out of the barrel that it kind of hides that heat. For the American small batch whiskey, um, uh, that it, it's right around two years old. What, it, what it's gonna do is make it so that our distillate is much softer. And what I'm trying to do with, with the American small batch whiskey is make a nice, soft, approachable whiskey that's simple. That's the way I like to describe it. It's not the you know, 15, 20 year old spirit where you're gonna wanna sip on it and contemplate death with a cigar. This is more, I, I kind of describe it as a table whiskey or, or in brewing parlance, a session whiskey, ignoring that it's 40% alcohol, obviously. But it's just nice and simple. And that's how I look at our, our American small batch whiskey. And the American small batch, just like the Maryland rye, just like the three chamber rye, the other thing that we do, do unusual, uh, that's unusual, that was done in the 1800s, and we have lots of records on this, the American standard in the 1800s for barrel entry proof was at 50%. That's what everybody put their whiskey down at was at 50%. This is a new thing to push it up in the 55 to 62.5% legal maximum for bourbon um, and for rye range. That's something that happened in 1962. So you kind of get back to what I was talking about with, with uh, the disappearance of the three chamber. Whiskey wasn't cool anymore. Sales were falling. The last of the Pennsylvania distilleries shuttered in the 60s. Same thing in Baltimore. And the distilleries were trying to figure out a way how the hell to keep their doors open. And so what they did was, and this is on file, by the way, if you're that much of a nerd, you want to look at the TTB circulars, you can see it on their website. In 1962, they petitioned the government to allow them to move the maximum ABD from 55% up to 62.5. The idea behind that, obviously, you can put more whiskey into fewer barrels. And when you think about the, the uh, uh, modern Rick House in Kentucky, it's 20,000 barrels to a Rick House. And if you're cramming 20%-ish more whiskey, depending on the proof, obviously, um, into that barrel, you're saving money on barrels, you're saving money on labor to move those barrels around, and you're saving money on the actual Rick Houses themselves. So it, it was basically them ch chasing dollars. And, and in, in my opinion, it has all kinds of, of uh, depending on who you ask, obviously, either negative or positive repercussions from putting it in at that higher entry proof. It's going to extract more tannins. It's going to extract more things that I'm not necessarily interested in. But most importantly, and the easiest thing to explain to a customer is when you're in at 50% alcohol and it comes time for me to drop this into a bottle, to drop it to 45 or 43%, I'm only adding a few liters. If you're in at that 62.5% and most of the Tennessee, Kentucky warehouses, the proof goes up, you're adding almost a third again water. You're washing out all of those flavors that you work so hard to develop in that barrel and, and washing all of it out. It just doesn't seem like a very good practice to me. So for our entry proof, it's 50%. And I don't know if you have any photos, uh, Tristan, of the Dunnage Warehouse, but um, we have a traditional Dunnage Warehouse, which is similar to what you would see um, in Scotland with earthen floors. This is intentional because here in Colorado, um, the the uh, water vapor that's in the air, the humidity is, is much lower here. So what does that mean? You got your permeable membrane with your barrel, the whiskey underneath, and the amount of water that you have sitting in the air will, will affect the evaporation rate or the angel's share. So um, if you have any, any suppliers that are in the Texas area or Texas or Arizona or Colorado and they don't do anything to their aging warehouse, um, what they'll tell you is their evaporation rate is, is in the double digits per year. Um, in Scotland, it's the guideline, everybody's different, yada, yada, yada. It's two and a half percent in Scotland, mild temperature, larger barrels. And in Kentucky, the baseline is four and a half percent. Here in uh, Colorado, because we have the earthen floors in, in, um, for our warehouse, um, we got the uh, evaporation rate per year is actually 4.1%. So that's saving us millions of dollars per year, but what's also a nice effect out of it is the proof doesn't move. And I wish that I was smart enough to tell you why, and I'm not. Um, happily, I don't really think anybody else is either, so that's not too big of a deal to admit. Um, but what that means is for the bottled and bond um, bourbon, which we're gonna be bringing out here in a couple months, um, uh, for all of these markets, for everybody at Winebow, it's in at 50%, it's cast strength. We're drawing that whiskey out at 50% and the proof is not moving at all. We don't have to add any water. Um, this was unexpected. I would like to say again that I was smart enough to know that that would happen, but I'm not. 
Um, but it's just kind of a fun thing for fun little nugget of information for your customers that when we roll out the bottled and bond bourbon here in a few months, it's actually cask strength. We're not putting that on the label because that'll just confuse the hell out of everybody in our opinion, right? So we're just going to keep it simple and, and it's just kind of a nice fun selling point for people to know that this is literally coming straight out of the barrel. Um, we do not dump our barrels, we decant them. Um, what that allows us to do, again, I think like a brewer, I never understood the idea of turning the barrel upside down and having all of that barrel char get roused up and then you have to filter it. Why would you do that? So what we do is we fill the barrels in place and we decant the whiskey off. Okay, so what that allows us to do, you will have an unfiltered bottled and bond bourbon here rolling out in a few months. Um, so that, so uh, that is the, both the American small batch whiskey, which we dropped down to 43%, but the bottled and bond bourbon is coming uh, pretty soon. Uh, should we move on to gin? Are we doing okay on time? Tristan, anytime you want to yell at me, please do. I'm just going to talk about you're, gin. You're, I'm sorry. I was on mute. Yeah. You're doing okay on time. So, um, okay. on the, some of the slides I have, I also have, um, a bourbon, uh, the four year at 90 proof. Is that, um, I haven't seen that in our market. Is that, that will be, that will be heading your way as well. I apologize for kind of jumping over that. Yes. So we will have the four year old. Uh, um, that yes, that is, is at 90 proof and we'll be releasing that together, um, together with the bottled and bond. So give people a choice as to what it is we want. Um, obviously, or, or not obviously, I'm expecting the, that the bottled and bond is going to be more suited to your uh, customer base, excuse me, um, more suited to your customer base. Uh, yeah, you, you, we're, we're chasing after the, the people that are serious about whiskey on that particular iteration. Um, so, um, a, a few things on that just real quick. Um, again, because of that lower ent entry proof and that lower fermentation temperature, you're going to notice that this is, uh, is much softer. I didn't want to chase after the Kentucky profile because they already do that, right? Big stone fruit, um, you know, those higher alcohols are there. It, it, it's a much larger whiskey. So, if you can think of a gas chromatograph with Kentucky bourbon for all the flavors, the, the whiskey for, for the, the, uh, the straight bourbon is going to look a little bit below that. So the, the flavors are, it's more of a finesse whiskey is I guess, I, I can't think of a better way to put it. Um, that it's more of a finesse whiskey. Hope that doesn't sound pompous. That's not my intention. Uh, Kentucky whiskeys are absolutely beautiful, but we already have them. Why would I want to chase after that same profile? So the, the flavors are going to be much more soft. We allow a spontaneous secondary fermentation. So we're fermenting in, in empty fermenters and just like brewers um, who get sick and tired of making the same damn IPA every day um, and, and like to drift into making sour beers, right? Where they're doing spontaneous fermentations and putting a little bit more art into what they're doing. We're doing the same thing at Leopold Brothers. It's difficult to explain in this format quickly. So um, suffice it to say, after our 72 hours of primary fermentation for the bourbon with three different yeast strains, we allow that mash to sit for an additional 48 hours. In that 48 hours, the lactic acid that rides in together with the floor malted barley that we use, will start to consume things that the yeast can't that yields organic acids. Organic acids in an alcohol solution. So, and so after we just take that mash and we distill it twice, it's now an alcohol solution. And we put that into a barrel those organic acids over time will react with the oxygen that's being drawn into that barrel and create esters. So it's a nerdy way of saying this spontaneous secondary fermentation is creating unique esters that are unique to the plant, unique to the environment that we're in, unique to the floor malt that we make on site. And what you're gonna wind up seeing both in, this, in the uh, four-year-old bourbon and the bottled and bond is a thread of orange marmalade. The orange marmalade note is coming from acetic acid that is transformed in the barrel after about three years, it starts to kind of peek its head out um, in a compound called octalacetate and that tastes like orange marmalade, okay? So to me, the, the, the uh, um, Kentucky whiskeys, the Kentucky bourbons, the two big notes that I get out of it, unless you want to wander down the Jim Beam Road and then that's banana cream pie is what it tastes like to me, but um, big stone fruit is what I get from the Kentucky whiskeys. That's the yeasts that they're using, that they're choosing. These are beautiful notes and a mustiness that they get. 
Um, uh, and to me, that comes from the dirt on the outside of the barrels. All they do is flip them over. So personally, I think it's dirt, but that's just my opinion. What the hell do I know? But anyways, when it, when it, comes, to the, uh, when it comes to our bourbon, you're going to get this thread of orange marmalade and this softness. And as your, your customers taste it and put a little work into it, right, and, and have a few sips, um, they're, they're going to realize how different and unique this is, which is what you want. What good does it do if I'm doing the same damn thing that they're doing at beautiful distilleries like Buffalo Trace and Heaven Hill? These are world-class distilleries, but I don't want to make our whiskey in the same way. Um, so that's what the four-year-old uh, uh, straight bourbon is. And you're also uh, going to notice one of the things that we do, we mash naturally, just like they do in Scotland. And again, it's leftovers from my German brewing days. Um, we mash naturally. We don't add exogenous enzymes. And what that means is in order to get that, the, the, uh, um, the, the corn and the rye starch to convert in the mash tun, I'm adding 20% malted barley. But this is another thing that you saw in these uh, dis distillery logs from the 1800s. 20% was pretty much the standard because you needed the, the enzymes in that distiller's malt to convert the corn and the starch. What you see nowadays is you'll see 3%, you'll see 5%, much lower malted barley. Using this elevated amount, what that does is it gives it a grassy note. The same thing that you get in Irish whiskey, right? If you don't know, the Irish whiskeys, the pure pot stills, they're using raw barley in it distiller's malt without boring it its ears. It's kilned at lower temperatures and so it retains that grassy note in it. And because we use 20%, you're gonna get a grassy kind of an Irish whiskey note in our whiskey that you won't see in other whiskeys. So that's the straight bourbon. Let's move on Scott, to the, oh, go right. ahead. I'm sorry, Todd. Um, if you can touch on maybe just the Maryland rye just briefly and just wanna know um, as far as the availability on that and just about a little bit about the whiskey before we move over to gin. Well, the Maryland rye, we kind of, we, we were a victim of our own success with the Maryland rye. And what was happening was um, bars and liquor stores were hoarding it <laughs> and not putting it on the menu and putting one bottle out at a time. So it was really difficult to get our sales anywhere where we needed to do it. Um, so what we've done with that is we, we, we won't have a Maryland rye release this year. Our plan is to release it as a five-year-old bottle and bond year round offering in 2022. So we're going to go without the Maryland rye for a little bit with the idea of giving people an elevated offering, stockpiling more of it so that it's year round, so that it's not as impossible to get to the point where, you know, bars just simply aren't even putting it on the menu. So it was kind of a victim of our own success with that. So the Maryland rye, real briefly, um, it, it was an homage to those Maryland distilleries that I mentioned um, that were last closed in the 1960s. At the time that we came up with it, there weren't any distilleries in Maryland that were making rye whiskey. Um, so we, we thought we'd have a little bit of fun and revive a style. I thought, what a shame. It's like the revival of IPA, for instance, to see a beautiful style get lost to history. So I did some research and, and you know, talked to some, some historians, Michael Veach, Charles Cowdery, those kind of characters, to see what it is their impression as to what Maryland rye was. And at the time, I didn't know there was such thing as, I don't know if you guys call them Dusties or a vintage spirits market. And people started sending me these old vintage uh, mothball distillery samples. The oldest one I had was from Hannesville and uh, I think it was bottled in 1875 or something like that. It tasted like salad dressing, by the way. So don't ooh and ah on that one, unfortunately. Um, but what these distilleries tended to have is this beautiful fruit note and a de-emphasis on the spiciness that you normally see in a rye. So that's what we did. So it, if you did not know, um, that was us. We were the first ones to come out with a Maryland rye several years back to try and reintroduce the style. And in my mind, um, because I, again, I'm not the brightest uh, guy out there, I thought that I'd be able to establish a style, right? To, to help um, other distillers come out with this style and really you know, find a place on a bar menu. Hey, the Maryland style tends to emphasize fruit a little less on the spice and really kind of help consumers. It's like the same thing as a high rye bourbon, you know, that people talk about these days. That was the idea behind it. And to pay home, you know, an homage to the distilleries that went under. And since then, of course, you know, Sagamore Spirits and some of the other distilleries in Maryland have popped up. And uh, s sadly, they don't listen to me at all. <laughs> um, actually, I think it's a great thing. They're all doing their own thing, right? Which is a beautiful thing as well. But that was the idea behind the Maryland rye. Um, was to help consumers um, 
uh, you know, kind of differentiate between various rye expressions. So unfortunately, you're just going to have to wait a couple years. But as I said, it, it'll be five years old and it'll be widely available to you. So if you can just uh, be patient, um, that'll come out. Should we move on to the gin? Yes, um, let's move on to some gin. Yeah. Okay, um, so gin, we first came out with the American Small Batch Gin together with our vodka in 2001. Um, and as you can imagine, um, we, we, it was us and, and uh, Anchor Steam, um, and Junipero for, for quite a while. Um, we're really kind of the only ones out there. and. It was uh, one, of, one of those things where there, 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 there really wasn't anything to, to look at in terms of, you know, an American style of gin. And, and again, being foolish, I thought I'd kind of come up with my own. So the, the, the you know, your, your classic bee feeder gin, which is a beautiful gin and a world-class gin, the way that they'd like to distill their, their botanicals in, they put all the botanicals into their very large pot and they distill it off at one time. And if you uh, go on YouTube and Modern Marvels for distilleries, uh, uh, you'll find a neat piece where the head distillers, I can't remember whether it was Desmond Payne or not at the time, but anyway, um, he explains his run. It's 10, 14 hours, something like that. It's been too long. I can't remember how long their run is. But in any event, he explained that he could tell what time it was by what flavors were coming off of the still. So at 10 o'clock, he'd taste the citrus notes. At noon, he'd taste the juniper. Angelica root comes out at 2 o'clock. What I'm trying to illustrate is, as you're boiling off the botanicals and the proof in the still is going down, even though you're applying the same amount of energy to that pot, the temperature is slowly going up in that pot still, right? And as it does, it's hitting the boiling point of the orange, the boiling point of the juniper, the boiling point of the angelica root, the oils that have all those flavors and aromas. And what they're trying to do in the London style is get, you know, kind of try and find a happy medium. And I kind of explain it, it's like trying to cook a steak and eggs and potatoes in the same skillet for the same amount of time. You're gonna try and find a happy medium, but you're not necessarily gonna get the best of all worlds. Of course, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. It makes a world-class gin. But what that also does is once you've gotten the best of the juniper and you're moving through the still to get the rest of the compounds, and you start moving into what I would call tails, you're starting to extract a compound called pinene out of that juniper. So if you run into people, I'm sure everybody has, who say they don't like gin, what they describe it as it tastes like Christmas tree or tastes like pine needles. What it is is boiling that juniper for longer and longer and extracting more of the pinene out. You're also going to extract more tannins and compounds out of the uh, plant matter that you're putting into the still. And that's what makes London dry gin dry. It's why people like to add vermouth to a martini. Um, vermouth, if I'm sure you all know, is flavored wine. There's going to be a little bit of residual sugar in that vermouth that's going to tamp down that sensation of tannin. That's what makes adding vermouth so pleasant in a martini. What we do to kind of get around that is we distill each botanical individually. So we'll run it just like we're running whiskey. So we'll have a head cut. Really, we're just cutting for clarity just the same way that you would for whiskey. So in other words, the first few liters, if you wind up putting that into the distillate, um, it will cloud up when you add water. Um, some of the younger distillers out there try to put that as a feature and say that they're gin louches and Anyway, uh, we don't do that here. We set that aside. Um, or you'll get a yellowish tinge to it from taking too much of that head cut. But in any event, as we start drifting into the, what I consider to be the tails cut, we stop collecting. We take the juniper distillate. We set it aside, empty the still, and we repeat that with the rest of the botanicals. So juniper, cardamom, uh, hands as to pomelos, hands as to, you get the idea. We take all of those distillates and I blend them together in a, a rough recipe. Uh, I'm tasting it as we're going and we're proofing it down slowly uh, and, and then bottling it. So what that does is it makes it so all our gins are much softer than, than the traditionally distilled gins basically is the idea behind it. So it, it does two things. One, it softens the finish. It's almost like we're adding sugar, of course, as I'm sure you know, we don't do that. We don't add glycerin or sugar to anything we make. Um, but it makes a very soft finish. But what it also does, it really makes it so that you can suss out all the botanicals that we put in. They're much brighter, they're much more vibrant in all of the, the gins that we make. And we use this for, for our American small batch gin. We use it for our, our uh, summer gin and we use it for our Navy gin. They're all distilled in the same way with different botanicals, different cuts. Um, 
uh, as you can uh, imagine, it, it, it's quite the process and it made a hell of a lot more sense when we were tiny and selling 100 cases a year, but what are you gonna do? So you can actually see the gin still, um, uh, to Tristan's left as you're looking at them, that's our gin still. So we'll run that, we'll put some of our house made spirit into that still and that's where we're gonna run uh, run our uh, distillate off. So for the summer gin, the, there are uh, kind of two, two big things that are in there. It's 47% alcohol. Um, it's kind of a not nice to make sure that bartenders have something that, that will really stand up to whatever cocktail they feel like making. Um, juniper berries first. So I did not pull back on the juniper. I kind of dialed that up from where our American small batch gin is. And this is very citrus forward. The big thing in there is blood oranges. Um, I'm trying to make it so it's refreshing, it's summery. In my mind, when I put this together, I had in my head Spanish gin tonics, right? Where it's basically in a coop and there's a whole forest in it, right? Basically where they're kind of going a little overboard with the beautiful garnishes and having some fun with it. Um, that's kind of where, where I uh, look at for the summer gin, but it makes a beautiful Negroni. It really goes into so many different cocktails, but it's very citrus uh, forward. But the two other things that were in there that I had some fun with, um, the immortal flower, the immortal flower is called that because even when you dry it, it looks like you just picked it. Um, so that's kind of where that slang came from. But it just has a beautiful, almost honeysuckle nose to it that I, I really like. Um, quick fun story on that because it looks like I'm doing okay on time. Um, I went to a couple of British gardening sites um, to ask because I wanted to try and find something new um, and ask some of these gardeners what, what their favorite flowers were, what their favorite aroma uh, was from flowers. And so in my mind, I'm picking, you know, 80 year olds named Nigel giving me advice as to what um, botanicals they thought really had a beautiful aroma. And then, uh, okay, so I found, you know, some things that, that were, that they really enjoyed, but some of them are illegal that, you, that aren't on the uh, GRAS, generally recognized as safe uh, list for the FDA. So that's a nightmare, can't do that. And some of them just didn't distill very well. Violet didn't work particularly well um, as a note, uh, but the immortal flower was just beautiful. So we used quite a bit of immortal, immortal flower in there. And then from there, lemon myrtle. Um, this is a, a leaf that's uh, out of Australia. Lemon to me, when we're talking about using Lisbon lemon or, or Meyer lemon or some of the other um, lemon varieties, unless you're just using a touch, to me it winds up smelling and tasting like lemon pledge. Uh, maybe it's because my parents had me polish too much furniture when I was a kid. I have no idea. But anyways, I never really liked the, the, the lemon that you get from actual lemons. Lemon myrtle, you're actually using the leaf from this, and it's a much more of a kind of a savory note to it that I like quite a bit. So that's in our, in, in our summer gin. Um, we're in the process of getting you 200 milliliter bottles on these. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that'll be a bit of a help because as we all know, things are moving to liquor stores and light, uh, lightning fast pace. Um, so we're looking to get those to you. So I'm sure Tristan will help share the news on when that's available. Um, we're trying to get those out as quickly as we can, as you can imagine. Uh, the supply chain is a bit of a train wreck these days for pretty much everything. So we're working on getting those as quickly as, as possible. Um, and uh, the Silver Tree Vodka is the base for this. So the Silver Tree Vodka, um, for that, uh, the fermentables in that, wheat is the biggest thing in there. Wheat, good wheat, beverage quality, beverage grade wheat, uh, tends to have an elevated amount of vanillin in it, which tastes like vanilla. So there's a nice vanilla note in it. We use a little bit of potato in there. I don't like 100% potato. Um, I don't know if it's one of those cilantro things with me, but I just don't care for, for vodkas that are 100% potato. But we add a small portion of it in it. And what it does is it improves the mouthfeel. To me, the difference between a, a good vodka and a great vodka really comes down to mouthfeel. And that, that's a mixture of how you're running that still, how you're running that column, and, and also what ingredients are you putting in. And potato has two things, elevated oil content, and it also has an elevated amount of methanol. And methanol in trace quantities kind of tastes a little bit creamy. So it's well below the legal limit, but it gives it a bit of creaminess without us, again, having to add uh, sugar or glycerin or anything like that. You know, for those of you who have never done the test, you can always on your fingers put a little bit of vodka on your fingers. If it never goes away, you know that they've added glycerin. Um, if it starts to get sticky, you know that they've added sugar. 
Um, and if it just obviously evaporates, you know that it's just vodka. It's a nice simple little trick on the vodka. That's our silver tree. And the silver tree, if you didn't know, is the base for the summer gin and, and the rest of our gins as well. So any, uh, any questions on that before we move on? We've got, we've got some questions coming in on the chat and the uh, Q&A, um, but I want to save those for just a bit. Um, we are kind of running up again because I want to keep at least 10, 15 minutes for our uh, Q&A and I don't want to run too long. Um, but if you can, can you just touch a little bit on the modifier world as far as like your fruit liqueurs and the aperitivo and the, I, I know I'm opening up another can of worms here, but. I'll try and go as quick as I can. Yes, it is a bit of a can of worms. Yeah. Um, so the aperitivo, just a couple quick differences. One, we're, we're coloring it naturally with cochineal. Um, Aperol and, and uh, the rest of that gang uh, stopped using and switched over to red dye number 40. Uh, red dye number 40, they switched over to that in 2002. Um, red dye number 40, if you didn't know, is petroleum based. Um, so for us, we sell food at Leopold Brothers, so we would never do that. So what we do is we switch over to Coconeal. We were the first uh, American aperitivo. We were the first American Fairnet, um, first American Maraschino. I can kind of go right on down the line. We like to explore categories where nobody was really in. The American Orange Liqueur, for instance, um, uh, was kind of our answer to Cointreau. Cointreau, as we all know, again, it's a beautiful cordial. I'm not saying uh, any bad things about it, but it's very high in sugar. So um, most cordials that are sold in America are about 30% sugar, usually 25 to 30% sugar. Um, everything at Leopold's is 20% or less, okay? So it's a much drier finish, and it lets your bartenders choose whether or not to, to put sugar into a cocktail. Uh, as I'm sure you've uh, figured out, you can put sugar in. There's no real quick way to take it out. So what we're allowing that, that bartender to do is to have a little bit more control over what it is they do and focus on flavors and not so much with the syrupy sweet cocktails. So the American Orange Liqueur is floating right around 17% sugar. It's very, very dry. Um, the the uh, blackberry liqueur and the cherry liqueur, well, again, this is a nice simple one. And this reminds me, of, I went to a multiple, uh, a chef that owned multiple restaurants down in Atlanta the first time we went down. And he was kind enough to sit down with me and say, I don't really understand your, your uh, cordials. These are beautiful, but I don't know what to do with them and I don't really understand them. And I walked him over to, to his back bar and I said, well, can I speak freely? And he said, yeah. And he said, okay, are you putting real meat in your steaks that you're selling here? And of course he looked at me like I was an idiot. He said, well, yeah, of course. And I said, well, you're, you're selling um, an apple liqueur that's lime green. Why are you selling your customers artificial flavors when that's not what you're about? It's not matching up with what it is you're doing in terms of the rest of your restaurant. And to us, we've always found success in trying to get them to get that connection to understand, you know, a lot of chefs and a lot of bar programs and not necessarily tying in um, what it is they're doing in the kitchen with what it is they're doing on the bar. Uh, and, and so that's a nice, simple kind of a sales uh, tool that we've seen um, with the blackberry and the, and the cherry. The other uh, thing that we have on that in terms of um, helping people understand what it's all about you're going to wind up running into customers that are going to have a bottle that is oxidized that have gone bad, right? Where it's been sitting on the back bar or it's in the sun or whatever. First of all, Leopold brothers will replace it. Okay. That's important to know. So you're not stuck with that. Um, but that's an opportunity. If somebody calls you up and says that, Hey, this, this went bad, go to their back bar and say, this is real fruit, this is real spirit, and they liquefy their sugar on, you know, on site. The question isn't why are, is the Leopold Brothers going bad? The question is what the hell's in those other cordials that they're not going bad, okay? And what that means is all, you know, stabilizers and all kinds of things that as we all know, you don't have to tell them what's in that cordial. There are no ingredients lists in spirits. They've been uh, promising us that that would happen for 20 years and it's never going to change. But to me, that's a wonderful opportunity, especially if, you know, you, these restaurants are serious about their food and people are serious about what they're putting into their bodies. Think about what you're putting on that back bar. So that's a nice, simple thing that we've learned. We've got traction over the years. It's an opportunity when they find that out. And yes, the Leopold brothers will be happy to replace that bottle. In addition to that, um, 
you're gonna wanna go ahead and, and uh, drop that into your cooler. If you keep it cold, it'll be fine for a year. The problem is, just like everything else, when it's real food, it's the temperature that's your enemy and oxygen that's the enemy. So if you get it cold, it's gonna stay good for a year. My wife always has a bottle of our, our blackberry liqueur in the refrigerator and it stays good for a very long time. How's that for quick? That was fantastic. Yeah, no, no. very concise. So we do have some questions that have come in. Um, so we had a um, question, what is the benefit of using your house-made uh, spirit versus, buy, uh, versus buying neutral grain for your gin? Uh, stupidity. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not the financially smartest thing to, to do. Um, uh, but what, what allows us to do is have a bit more control. And we, we got into this because it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to make things. Um, as I'm sure all of you would imagine that, that we've, you know, had people come and, and see whether or not we're for sale when they were, uh, you know, all, all of these various companies were looking to uh, buy us. And I just, what the hell would I do if you bought the distillery? Um, it's fun. It's the same reason we make our, our floor malt. It gives me another lever of control that others don't have to get the exact flavors that I'm looking for. But the real honest answer is it's fun. Making malt is fun. Making spirits is fun. That's what we got into this for. I, I didn't get into this so that I could be a marketing guy. I have no talent for it. <laughs> um, but, but that's the advantage. It gives us another uh, lever to pull um, and, and also allows us to, you know, to buy grains from the farmers that we know. Awesome. Another question. Uh, will the next Maryland rye come from the chamber still or the pot still? No, pot still. The, the, the three chamber rye, because as you've seen with all of our names, we're really inventive, is going to be called three chamber rye whiskey. So that has not been released yet. The three chamber rye whiskey, we are going to, and you'll see my lovely face in all your markets, because it's going to need some explanation, obviously, um, next fall. So next fall, 2021, we'll have the five-year-old bottled and bond out of the three chambers still. We'll also be setting some aside for 10 and 15-year-old and yada, yada, yada. But the Maryland rye is only in the pot stills and that will be releasing again as a five-year-old in 2022. Perfect. Um, so does, and another question was, does the chamber still predate the coffee still? It does not as far as we can tell. Um, all of these things, it, it, yeah, I, I, I don't like going with absolutes with any of this stuff because somebody turns up a document that turns everything upside down. But as far as I can tell, um, it, is, it came out after, but it's, it's kind of impossible to tell. Um, and, and the nice thing is, as I mentioned, next year I'll be coming out um, we'll have little animations that explain where the gas goes and how it all works. And, and um, we'll be getting our act together because everybody wants to understand how the hell the damn thing works. Um, I've, I've explained it in person to distillers and they still kind of look at me like they got half of it. So um, we'll, we'll be explaining the idea behind it, how it's different. The nicest thing about the three chamber still, you don't have to understand any of it. The whiskey is entirely different from anything you've ever had before which is of course what you want, right? Who the hell wants the same, you know? Um, MGP does a lovely job of supplying whiskey to the world. It's beautiful whiskey. Um, but, but the nice thing is you don't have to understand it in order to know that the, the whiskey itself is different. Great. Uh, another question, how does elevation play into boiling point in the stills? And if it does, how does that affect the final product? It doesn't, thank God. Um, and I'm one of the few distillers in the world that can tell you that because we moved from Michigan, which I've, it's been a while. I think we were at 580 feet um, as I think where, we, where the stills were in Ann Arbor and we're at 5,280 feet where we are right now. It does change the boiling point. I thought I was gonna have to restructure our gin, right? And the recipes and where the cut points were and all of that kind of stuff and I was agonizing over it um, when, when we first arrived here. And I tried and did everything I could to you know, taste the various points of the distillation. There's no difference uh, in, in what it does. There's some, some distillers who like to say, 
you know, uh, okay, the, the, you're changing what the boiling point is and therefore the flavor extractions are different. Yeah, I guess so. Um, that, that's certainly scientifically true. I cannot tell a difference uh, palate wise. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm sure if you'd plotted it on a GC, you, you might see a difference, but I can't tell the difference on it. But there are a lot of distilleries that like to market it. You know, it's like talking about water. Um, you know, they, everybody talks about water and spirits. And then, you know, if you're smart, you'll ask the distiller, hey, can you show me your water treatment plant? And they say it's right over there. And I said, well, I thought water was, you know, so there's a bit of marketing nonsense in my opinion, and that's for what it's worth. Thank you. Um, kind of more of a, a sales question here. And this is a good question as far as uh, barrel program for bourbon. Uh -huh. I think that might be uh, something down, down the road, a single private. Yes. yes. And, and it, it, it is absolutely something that we can do. We're open to anything. If somebody wants to buy a barrel off of us, the answer is yes. Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it's something where we, we can get things together. Um, uh, you know, in flask samples, we'll allow them to, you know, to pick from five barrels. And this will be the case for the three chamber as well, actually. We'll, we'll give them a nice selection of, of five barrels or so that they can kind of pick from, or they can, you know, write me back and say, Todd, this is shite, send me five different samples. Um, we, we, we can work something out and, and we're absolutely happy to do that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. We're a small distillery, right? Um, th th this is what we should be all about, trying to give your, your, uh, your customers and their guests a unique experience and, and uh, unusual whiskeys and, and things that are made differently. It's the thing I'm proudest of. Now, whether or not you like that we make things differently, uh, that's not up to me, obviously, but we want to do everything we can to make sure that we're making things, our production methods, you know, what it, the stills that we use, every, every little bit has been well thought out. Um, and that it's with intent and your customers should be able to taste these changes and choices that we've made. And then it's just up to them as to whether or not they like it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question as far as when you're saying, and you don't, you don't dump, you decant, what, how does that work? Um, is it pumped out? How, how is the decant? decanting process? Well, it depends on what, so we go four high in the barrels. So the first two, you can just put in a stainless steel tube with a spring at the bottom. So it just sits just above where the char is. And we can start the siphon and walk away and go find something else to do for 30 minutes or an hour. Um, the ones that are on the bottom level, we just have a small, uh, what's called a diaphragm pump. It, it allows us to pump the whiskey out um, without electricity. It's an explosion hazard. If you didn't know, um, whiskey at 55 uh, per, or whiskey, anything uh, that's at 55% ethanol concentration or higher is explosive. <laughs> um, you know, 50% plus is a nice, easy way to think of it. If you've got more water than the al alcohol, the water will put that fire out, right? So at 50%, that's really where your danger point is. It's another reason that we do it. We're 20 years in and knock on wood. Uh, this is our 21st year, actually. We haven't had an accident. So an added benefit of putting it in at that 50% um, our warehouse is much less dangerous to work in, uh, which I'm a big fan of as lightning storms roll through here in the summertime, right? Um, right. But, but yeah. Um, one, a couple more here. Um, someone asked, uh, can we come to Denver to pick the barrel ourselves? Of course. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, I'm kind of here all the time. Uh, um, so, if you need to come here uh, on a Sunday or a Saturday, my home is five minutes away from here. So I'm happy to show you around. It's usually what we call the Gilligan tour. It's usually three hours long, um, which sounds like torture, but there's alcohol. So it's not so bad. <laughs> um, but, you know, or if you're just on your way skiing and you don't have time for that nonsense, no problem. You can come in and just taste through at our tasting room and off you go. It's a, whatever it is that, that, that you need. Um, of course, you are welcome here anytime. And if I had to take a wild guess, uh, uh, airfare is going to be very low in the next year or so. So, right? One yeah. small positive out of this car crash. Well, there you go, Bruce. We'll, uh, we'll fly out there. That uh, was more from one of our uh, whiskey aficionados here in, uh, in Georgia. Right on. And it looks like Holly asked, uh, what is Todd's favorite spirit that they make? 
Picking between all your children. Yeah, that's exactly, that, it's what we call the favorite kid question. Um, happily, my wife and I only have one, so that's an easy question, but it's not as easy. It, it, it's whatever is in front of me at the time. Um, the, the story I like to relate, I was uh, uh, having dinner for the first time when we moved to Colorado with uh, Jake Norris, who at the time was the head distiller from Stranahan's. And he relayed to me that, you know, how the hell do you make all these different spirits? Um, you, you, you must be insane. What's the, how are you doing all of these different spirits? And I looked at him and said, I don't know how the hell you can show up to work every day. If I knew that on a Wednesday in 2026, I knew that I was making malt whiskey again, I would top myself. I could not do that. Um, so, so for me and for the guys, it's two things. One, it keeps us intellectually engaged. You're not bored making the same, you know, Budweiser or Bud Light every day, right? It keeps us engaged. And Distilling gin makes us better at understanding whiskey. Making whiskey makes us better at gin. The f working with the fruit, you know, it, all of these things make us better distillers as we're on these stills. And um, if you don't know, I'm the late shift here. So we're 20 years in and I'm distilling more than I ever have. And that's the exact opposite um, from the way most producers, right? You get into that 10 to 20, you know, it, these days, I guess you work for two or three years and then you out, you're doing, it's why you don't see me very often, which is the downside. Um, but I'm actually running the still and I learn every day. It's one of my favorite parts about my job is I can't go and, and the most frustrating part, I can't go a week without realizing I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Something comes up and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why that, you know, and you go down in a rabbit hole to try and, you know, understand why something does um, you know, what it's doing and making more of these spirits, it, it makes me a better distiller. It makes me better at every little aspect of my job. And you, you learn something every day. And it's kind of the, my favorite thing about what I do is I just turned 50 this year. I just turned 50 during this mess, actually. Um, uh, Ellie, my five-year-old, was good enough to do an improv dance on the lawn in celebration of death. So it wasn't all bad. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, uh, as we're getting into this, uh, as I get older, I can still run these stills. You know, the younger guys do all the heavy lifting and the actual work, but the nice thing is I can do this into my uh, 60s, 70s, and hopefully 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, that's all. The other nice thing, I guess everybody else is eating a ton. I'm down 40 pounds on the year. Uh, so... Uh, that's been another positive thing. I, yeah, I, don't ask me why, but food, I have no interest in it the, the last couple, uh, couple of months, which I guess is better than the other way around. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're a very hands-on distillery. It's myself and three other people in production. Um, that's who's making all of these spirits uh, for you. So it's a very small crew and we're very organized and they work very hard here. Todd, that is fantastic. Thank you. And we pretty much nailed our timing here because we are barely at All right. We've only lost one attendee. So that, that's fantastic. Um, that's probably when I started in on the birthday part. They just had <laughs> oh, I don't need to hear this crap. I'm out. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Well, Jess, do you want to do you want to say anything before we wrap up here? Um, Todd, I just want to thank you from everyone at Winebow at allowing us to represent your brands. And we are honored every single time we walk into a place and present your brands because it's everything that we believe in at Winebow. And just hearing you talk and the way you explain your products, you can tell how passionate and that passion comes through. But truly, like I say, like I have a distillery crush. I was texting everyone it, and, and that's from everybody at Winebow. So Thank uh, you and really allowing us to sell your products because it brings a smile to all of our faces every day. Well, it's greatly appreciated and we're, we're still surprised that anybody cares about what we do. And it's one of those things where a, a lot of the distillers, the geezers, well, the second wave geezers, the, you know, like uh, Lance Winters at St. George. And you know, we all marvel that, that people understand what we're doing and appreciate what we're doing. And we just feel so lucky. I've got the best job in the world. And, and so when people say that I'm passionate, it's like, well, I get to work with my family, not too much, right? Uh, <laughs> um, it's one of the nice things about the teamwork of my brother and I. Um, you know, he, his undergrad was at Northwestern and Econ. He does all the business stuff. I can barely re read a spreadsheet. 
And as we like to say here, he couldn't ferment his way out of a paper bag. So that keeps us from bumping heads and allows us to work together. And the people that we have, Taryn, who many of you have met, and Ali, they're just, we're lucky to have them. We're working with the people that we want. Uh, we're lucky enough to get creative freedom. Who the hell gets that, right? So we understand how lucky we are. And so it's really the other way around. Thank you for, for representing us and explaining. It's not easy to explain to people um, what Leopold Brothers is, is all about. So your work is greatly appreciated uh, a lot more than you know. And, the, and as I mentioned, um, when this stupid, I was gonna swear, when this thing is past us, um, uh, there could be a five-year-old in the audience, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you'll be seeing us. We will, we will be out there. We will be explaining the chamber still to, to you. We have other things that are in the, in the works, you know, to get people to understand these things. And, and these are things that the whiskey nerds are going to be chasing after because, you know, we don't have thousands of barrels. We have what we believe is plenty um, for, your, for your best customers out there. And the great thing is, is, you know, we're going to be able to get something in your hands that's going to be sought after, I guess. And so we're, we're, ho we're looking forward to rewarding you for all of your hard work and to get you spirits that people want. So thank you. Thank you. Looking uh, forward to it. Thanks. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, I'm out. Everyone. All right. Cool. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.